Thanks for tuning in to the Women's Vibrancy Code, a podcast dedicated to helping women move from exhausted to energized, balance their hormones, and feeling turned on by their life, their lover, and themselves. I'm your host, Mariah Brown. I'm a Yale and functional medicine trained women's health expert, midwife, mom, keynote speaker, and self-made entrepreneur. I'm the founder of my signature program, the Women's Vibrancy Code. So sit back relax, and let's chat about your energy, hormones, libido, and embracing your feminine power. Oh, and you might want to have pen and paper to take some notes on some of these episodes. Okay. Hey, everybody. Mariah Brown here with Deborah Diggs today. This is going to be a fun one. She is a sober empowerment coach and so for those of you that are wanting to live fulfilled lives maybe you're wanting to live successful lives and you know that addiction whether you want to accept it or not might be getting in the way and that's addiction to any of it shopping sex alcohol um self-loathing i mean we could go all sorts of places but I'm excited for this conversation and let me tell you a little bit about Deborah, and then we're just going to kind of flow with it. We don't necessarily have a specific agenda. So Deborah Diggs has been seen on MTV, Oprah, Muscle Fitness, NBC, Howard Stern, Playboy and others, and she is a sober empowerment coach. She's been on commercials and covers of magazine and had all the fame. And what she says is that did not keep her sober. That did not help her feel happy or fulfilled or connected. She says the way you deal with the pain from your past was to distract yourself. You use shopping, drinking, alcohol, or traveling to escape the hurt and unbearable feelings that were just too painful to feel, and you're ready to heal so you can finally experience the love and joy that has been missing in your life. When we heal from our past hurts, it makes room for new experiences like connecting with others, on a deeper level, as well as feeling at peace about who you are. This is what you really want. And she works with individuals that say, I'm ready. So she's been on her business journey since 1983 from a professional cheerleader for the LA Express to the entertainment world. She is ambitious and was an, has always been aspiring to work in a very glamorous business, but now wanting to do it in a more fulfilling way. And now in her 50s, she wants to do what she loves and with a new appreciation and an approach of love and digging in and leading with love. So Deborah, I'm really excited to have you here today. First question is how how is that for you to hear those things, to hear me say them out loud? It's like a flashback. <laughs> it's like little slideshow flashbacks. And I just can't believe it goes in a blink of an eye. But first, let me just thank you, first of all, for allowing me to space and having me here with you and sharing the space with me. So thank you for that. And I want to just make sure we pronounce my name correctly. It's Driggs, like Driggs, Idaho. Oh, good. <laughs> Deborah Driggs. And being that that is like, you know, the brand, I mean, I, you know, it's so funny. I don't know about you, but nowadays with social media, people are hacking and taking over and all this stuff. And when I tried to fight back, I lost an account on Instagram. I'm like, my name is my trademark. You yeah. know, like I'm like on IMDB and all these things that I worked my whole life. You know, my name is my brand. And, and they were like, sorry, like nobody helped me. No, it was just wild. And that was my first kind of like, wow, this is what our world is kind of becoming with the metaverse and social media. And so we have to be really careful of that. And I thought, wow, mm. your name can be taken so easily on these platforms. But anyway, that is my name, Deborah Driggs. And, and yes, I am known as a sour, uh, sour, <laughs> sober empowerment coach. And that's because I created Deb's Den and I created a safe place to heal for people, a safe private place to heal because a lot of those things that you mentioned, alcohol, drugs, shopping, gambling, all of that, I have to say, you know, it's 
it's private. It's private stuff. And so I created Deb's Den, which is a very private, safe place. When I do this kind of stuff, I don't, I don't record anything so that people can share freely about what they're suffering from. Mm -hmm. I know this because I suffered quietly for four decades. I was, I woke up one day in a mental institution in 2008. And that was kind of when the wake up call came in for me was how did I get here? How did I get from being on the cover of all these magazines and, you know, being on Oprah and being interviewed by Howard Stern and being chosen to be on soap operas and commercials and all of this, those things did not keep me sober. I woke up at 40 years old, really dealing with the mental illness of, of alcoholism. And so I've spent years kind of working my way around this addiction. And I have to say what scared me more than anything wasn't waking up in a mental institution, but what scared me the most was that finding out only 2% of people that visit rehab or go on a sober journey will stay sober. And that's mm. staggering. Those are staggering numbers. You know, 2%? Where, where, where We have a lot to work with here. Well, I'm hearing two things. Number one, well, three things, really. Number one, I'm hearing you had all the fame. Yeah. And we look at people on TV and Oprah, I mean, that's definitely on my bucket list. And to be reminded that even the achievement of the things, the money, the relationships, the trips, the travel, the goals accomplished, even those individuals that we put up on a pedestal still have their own inner child work. And they still yeah. want to be heard and seen and have loneliness inside and hide addiction to whatever it may be. And so I imagine to come out of the closet, so to speak, and look yourself in the mirror from a place of self-acceptance of this is really happening and I can't deny it any longer. What was that like? That's when the work began. You know, when you, when you wake up and you, you look in the mirror and you don't, I was unrecognizable to myself. The world saw me one way. I saw myself a different way. And I, I looked in the mirror and I was unrecognizable. I thought, who is this person? You know, it's like living with a stranger almost. And so that's where the work began. I had to really, you know, take those layers of my environment growing up the trauma growing up, all those things. I don't think those things made me alcoholic or made me uh, have an addiction. They contribute, but that's, you know, that's, I don't, I don't blame anybody because that's not going to help or serve anybody when you become like, oh, it's because of this. I had to work. I had to work. I had to fight my way back. And it's the first year is like, what? It's brutal because it's like learning to live a different way. And I self-medicated for years. Mm -hmm. Something came up and I go, oh, I know how to, I know how to fix this. Take a couple of drinks and get that like, okay, everything's okay feeling. And so to learn a different way of how to treat that, that's where the work began. Mm -hmm. And it's super interesting to look back, like when you were playing the slideshow in the beginning, you know, to look back because I remember certain things and the way I felt and the way I looked was like totally different from how I felt and how I looked was two extremes. I'm actually reading Matthew Perry's biography right now, his memoir, because mm -hmm. he almost died two years ago from addiction. Mm -hmm. And he, and he says, this, you know, he goes through like the interviewers are showing pictures and he'll be like, Oh, that's when I was on pills. Oh, that's when I was drinking. Oh, yeah, that yeah. isn't that interesting that that's as an, as a person who's addicted, we can look, I can look at photos of my history and do the same thing. Oh, that's when I was doing this or that, you know, like, and it usually has something that was kind of like a painful struggle, mm -hmm. turmoil going on. And I was listening to him being interviewed and I thought, wow, I get it. And I imagine as painful as it was for you to kind of recalibrate who I am, who am I in the world and how do I be in the world in a different way, there was probably some big recalibration in your community. All the friends that also were like, wait a minute, 
we have an unspoken agreement that this is how we relate or this is who I know you as. And so what did that look like in how people in your world, your your family, your friends, your coworkers, how did they meet you as you changed? Brilliant question. Yeah, that is probably one of the most important aspects of getting sober because unfortunately, and it's not their fault, but because I'm changing, a lot of those people aren't going to go on the ride. They're not going to go, they're not going to go with me. They're going to stay exactly where they are. And a lot of the people that I associated with or had some sort of connection with was based on alcohol. Mm. And so when you get sober, unfortunately, those connections, acquaintances, they drop off. It's just part of the deal. Mm. And it's it, some do and some don't. You know, I know the people that really care about me and really want to hang out with me because they want to hang out with with me <laughs> and not me drinking. There's two, those are two different sets of friends. And so you find that out when you get sober. And I think anybody who's gone on this journey of getting sober knows that you're going to, that it's kind of like it, that part of your life dies off. And mm -hmm. now this new part. And, and really the beautiful thing is that now I have so many people in my life. My, my core group is real strong now. It's very different. It's, we're talking about things that are meaningful. I had a Zoom last night with four women that are just amazing. Mm -hmm. And we're all, we just met like as entrepreneurs and people in business and, and sharing ideas and thoughts that wouldn't have happened a decade ago. You know what I mean? Like I would have been like, well, let's have a glass of wine while we do this, you know? And, and, yeah. you know, it's very different now. It's a very, mm -hmm. I don't have to think about doing anything but being there and connecting in the moment with you. That's it. It sounds like there's a lot more depth and fulfillment. And I like at the beginning when I was reading your bio that it's not just addiction to alcohol that you're now supporting people in. It's addiction to travel. It's addiction to shopping. It's addiction to whatever it may be. And if that is how we've traditionally existed in the world, addiction to work, and that's how our community sees us, then there's this dying off of who I see in the mirror, who I've been, how I've existed, what my coping mechanisms have been. Like for me, I grew up in one of those lives, childhood, where self-preservation was my coping mechanism. Like I feel threatened, I can put up my walls, I got this, I'm not gonna ask for help. And for me, I tend to go into work. And so when I watch myself, I go, oh, there I am again. Can I put the walls down and allow myself to show up vulnerably and and still have visions and drive to succeed, but to do it in a, in a different way? And then so there's this recalibration of who I see in the mirror. And there's also the recalibration of the dying off of people that became accustomed to this is how I know you. But it sounds like you're you're feeling now the version of you after sober for how long now oh gosh over a decade over a decade sober and now how when you look at the deborah driggs not digs driggs <laughs> that you are today how are you different when you look in the mirror when you when you think about who you be in your relationships when you think about how you exist in your work and with your family, like who is, who is the Deborah now compared to then? I would say that I take full responsibility for how my life goes. I have a very, very structured routine in my life that is empowering. So I fully depend on that. I have a routine. I set how the day is going to go, because if I, if I just wake up and kind of float around, then the day's going to go however it wants. And I like to wake up and kind of have that consistency and that it, it works in business too. You know, it just, it just works in both. I don't use anything outside of myself anymore to fix something going on inside. If something's going on on the inside now, I, I sit with that uncomfortable. I, you know, it's the uncomfortableness that I just sit with today that I couldn't sit with 10 years ago, could not sit with it. 
And today I just sit with it. I sometimes sit quietly for hours. I couldn't do that 10 years ago. And I can sit quietly now and go, okay, this is, I know now that it will pass. And before I would think I'm always going to feel this way. And I'd go into a complete full spin and think that I had anxiety or think that I was depressed and try to put a label on it, you know, and today I can just sit with feelings that are uncomfortable. And it's kind of fascinating to me that they'll happen. They just do. And then they pass. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have to take a pill or take a drink or get on an airplane and go be with some stranger in Cabo to disconnect from this Right. with something externally. I don't have to do that anymore today. And that's the biggest difference because I was a runner with a capital R. Like there'd just be like this big R on my face, a runner, she's a runner. You know, things got bad and I'd just be like, where are we going? Who are we, you know, just like impulsive, you know. So in Al-Anon literature, there's this thing called the checklist for maturity. The first time I saw this checklist, I was like, wow, I'm really in trouble. I'm like, you know, a 50 year old in the body of a 12 year old. You know, I had no maturity whatsoever. I saw that list and I thought, wow, I, I, I could answer like, I do that. I do that. I do that. The biggest one was makes decisions impulsively without really thinking it through. And that was one of my biggest, you know, I'm just like, if you said, you want to go to Cabo? I'd go, yeah, let's go. Mm -hmm. You know, or you want to go do that? Like, I just never sat and thought about Right. Well, let's think about this. What's motivating you? And where I go is the hormonal piece. So I'm like, all right, that's dopamine. That's like looking for the dopamine from the perspective of um, impulsivity and decisions to, to get that hit. But then dopamine also being that hormone of addiction. Yeah. Um, by the way, we love addicts. Like we're like the dopamine hits keep them coming. Right. Yeah. That's what we, it's hard to sit in the, when everything's like nothing's happening. For mm -hmm. an addict, that's really weird because we're constantly looking for the hit. Right. And I say this all the time, and you read my bio, that attention was my first addiction. And when that so stopped working, then we got, you know, you, the alcohol went headstrong. Right. You know? And so is there still a part of you that would love to be on the cover of magazines and back on Oprah and in TV and interviewed in, by Howard Stern, but just in a through a different lens and in a different context in a different lens and and now the beautiful thing about where i'm at today is in my 20s and 30s i just said yes to everything with no thought of what my motive was or you know it was just like oh you want me for that yeah you know today i really align myself with things that align with what i'm doing or what my brand is it's a very different time in our world, even, you know, back in when I was in my twenties, I feel like, I feel like now I'm like my mom, you know, or my grandparents when they used to talk back in the day, but it's kind of true. There was no social media when I was in entertainment there, you couldn't Google me. You couldn't get an instant, you had to pay to see people. You had to pay for a magazine, mm -hmm. you know, now you can see everything is just so readily available. Yeah, I think today it would be different. I think I would, I think I'm kind of on this mission today to help people one on one or in a group setting who are suffering quietly. And that's a very different mission than I had before it was all about me. It's not all about me today. Nothing is all about me. As a matter of fact, when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I really do is I thank God, the universe, every, you know, for just allowing me another day. Yeah, you know, I'm going to be 59 in a couple in a in like eight days. I'm going to be 59 years old. So you know, I've I've lost a lot of friends, and I've lost a lot of friends to this disease of addiction. So I'm always grateful for another day of waking up. And so I start out, thank you, thank you, and how can I serve? You know, what can I do today to help somebody? You know, it's not about me anymore. Once I get into the, it's about me, and I need to get on this cover, or I need to do this. It, it just doesn't go, it doesn't go well, mm -hmm. but when I get into how can I serve, or maybe I can write an article for that magazine, maybe I can contribute. It, it has a whole different energy to it. Yeah. Yeah. It's way more impactful. I'm wondering 
over these 10 years of sobriety, and congratulations again to be part of that 2%, on the days where like the, the picture that I have is you've got that thing of alcohol there in your kitchen and it would be so easy to just in your in in your mind push the easy button and yeah. take that drink what kept you going to stay on this new journey that I imagine is far from easy yeah you know there are days where it's really hard and my my thinking, if I start thinking, you know, I have a good idea. <laughs> you know, I have people now that I run those ideas by first, mm -hmm. no matter what, even if I feel like picking up a drink, I run that idea by somebody and they can help me run a tape that goes, remember where that took you. And then I go, oh yeah. And then it kind of passes. So I have that support in my life today. You have to, I, well, not everybody does. I do. I have to have that support. I also have a I've set up my life today where it's very, it's set up for success. So the minute I wake up, I have something that I do midway, mid morning. I have something that I do. I reach out to other people that I know that are suffering. I, I have things set up in a way where it makes it a little bit easier to succeed in staying sober mm -hmm. in staying in service, in staying in gratitude. And if I start to slip away from doing those things, I get wonky. Right. I absolutely get wonky and I feel it and I know, and then I will have to take kind of like, okay, what do I do right now? Cause I'm really feeling wonky. Luckily right now in my life, I don't get that that often as much, you know, and I think it's because of the work that I do. Mm -hmm. Because you're in service of others and there's a whole absolutely. new level of accountability. Like I'm thinking, I know a friend who she really needs and she knows that she needs to get sober, but she continues to try it on her own. I and did that for years. It's such a different yeah. picture when you go, no, I'm going to show up vulnerably. I'm going to raise my hand and allow myself to be seen and acknowledge that I need some help. Even if the help feels imperfect because all the help we all struggle with our own crap as well, and we're not perfect, and AA is not perfect, and whatever route you take isn't perfect. But it sounds like you you set up the routines and you set up the infrastructure of people to be there to help you so that it wasn't you doing it all by yourself. Yeah. And now you support- Well, that's the others. opposite, by the way, that's the opposite of addiction, right? Here's addiction. It's a very isolating disease. It's a mental illness disease. Mm -hmm. And then the opposite of it is connection. Hmm. So it's really interesting when you can look at it that way, because really to be sober is to be connected. It's to be hmm. connected to you, to other people, and to have that foundation, not just with, I don't have to just be with sober people. I mean, I find it interesting now to just be available to any, not anyone, but to people that maybe want to have coffee and, you know, it's, there's something about connecting on that very universal level. When you connect, it kind of pulls you even further away from this mental disease, because yeah. that's what the addiction does. It really does want to get you alone. It wants to get you alone and tell you you're okay. Imagine having something in your mind constantly wanting to get you alone in private and isolate you from the world and say, you're okay. You got this. You can drink. It seems like, like the visual that I see is a buffer. It's like the, the walls just get bigger and bigger yeah. as a self-preservation. I'm not going to connect. I'm just going to put up more walls. Yeah. So I don't have to feel. And so now you've taken all of your background, which sounds like it's super broad and varied, and now you're supporting others. So are you supporting people specifically in the entertainment industry along their journey of sobriety or how do, how does it have, I have a couple, a couple women that are in the entertainment industry that are my clients. I would say that what happened for me is in 2000, excuse me, 2020, I decided to go to this place in Tennessee and do some trauma work. You know, I wanted to keep expanding on my, on my sobriety. And so I went and did this trauma work. It was a week 
of really intense trauma work. And while I was there, you can kind of choose what you want to work on. So I worked on some childhood abuse and then I worked on my divorce because I never really healed from my divorce in 2004. And so when, when I was leaving, I said to my counselor who I absolutely loved, and I said, now what? I just did this whole week of trauma work. What do you suggest now? What do I, what should I do now to keep expanding on this? And he had a couple suggestions, but nothing really like, you know, and I like, I'm one of those people that I like directions and I want to keep expanding on things and keep learning and growing. And that I got home that was in October in November. I woke up in the middle of the night. It was 2 AM. I have two whiteboards in my office and I literally wrote out my 90 day program. I'm like, this is the program. This is the 90 day program. This is like when people leave there, they should come and do my program with me. Mm. And so I like wrote out this 90 day program, but then I went through it myself and it was really, I was like, well, this is really hard for me. This is going to be hard for people. But what I found is I got to a whole other level because I removed everything that could prevent me from getting really healed, like really healing. Cause I thought I just did all this trauma work. So things are going to come up now. How am I going to continue to heal? And that was my biggest goal. How am I going to continue to heal? And so I created, that's what Deb's Den, I created Deb's Den at two in the morning, you know, just out of like, I want to keep healing. And I used everything I learned from this place, but then everything I had learned these, you know, from 2009 to now, Mm -hmm. everything from, and even like I spent three years traveling around with Tony Robbins. So I, I did, I had little bits and pieces from that. And then I met master co, you know, you meet all these teachers along the way, but the main stuff comes from my real vigorous, uh, sober program. And so I may, I created a 90 day program that isn't just for people who are addicts. I'm taking this woman through it. She called me in a panic. And she said, I know you're a life coach. That's what she said, because she sees me on social media and she knows me from the nineties and we kind of lost touch. And she called me in a panic and she said, I know you're a life coach and da, 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 da. I know you're helping people. I need help. And she was in complete, and I could hear it, you know, and I just let her talk, let her talk. And, but what she's suffering from isn't addiction. She's suffering from something else. And I said, let me take you through my 90 day program. What do we have to lose? If it doesn't help you, I'll give you your money back. Mm. If it does help you, I need a, I want you to be like my first testimonial because I really want to take you through this because I did it with the kind of feeling of healing from trauma, but I think it might work for you. Mm -hmm. And it did because she was really struggling. And so that's, that's where Deb's Dan and my coach, I actually was speaking on business and business coaching and all of that before COVID. And then when COVID hit, I went, I thought, well, I'll go do some trauma work. There's businesses shut down. Mm -hmm. I'll go do some trauma work. And then from that, Deb's Dan, I started writing a weekly blog. I wrote a chapter in a book called Suffering Quietly About Addiction. I started going in a different direction and it's, and now it's evolved into me really coaching twice a month via Zoom and, and working one-on-one with people who are really struggling. And so who is the person that you're like, hey, knock, knock, listen, I can help. Here's, 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 I see you, like, here are your pain points. Here's what your life is currently like. Here's the the aspects of denial that you're currently in. And if you lean in, here's what I can help you with. Me, 20 years ago, you know, somebody who's successful, silent and suffering. You know, it's me 20 years ago. It's, it's. But you 20 years ago, do you think you really knew the st- extent to which you were suffering. Like I know there are people listening going, yeah, this is really nice, but maybe it's not for me. Yeah. I would oh. say, yeah, I, I did not. I knew something. I knew there was something I never thought. I never would say the word alcoholic because I thought, well, I, 
once in a while, I drink too much. You know, I'd always have the excuse, the denial, you know, the red, the, the, the little denial flag that pops up. <laughs> you're in denial. You're in denial. Um, but I would never say that word. I just thought, well, I don't think I'm an alcoholic. And by the way, I had people telling me as well, confirming you're not an alcoholic mm. because people base that on, mm. look at, you're doing all these other things. So great. Well, that's, that's true, but I wonder what they would look like if I wasn't drinking. Mm -hmm. I wonder how much better all that would look if I wasn't drinking. And that was the question that was keeping me up because I thought, what, what, if, what would my life look like if I wasn't drinking? I think there's something inside of everybody that starts to question when they're suffering that they need help. And then the fear prevents them from asking for help. I think I knew for years that I needed help and I just wouldn't ask for it. I just didn't know where to turn. I wish, I mean, look at today. Today, you can go on Facebook and everybody's got some type of join me for free to learn about this, whether it's how to exercise better, whether it's how to you know, clean out, out your closet your and your passion and your libido. Yes. <laughs> I'm okay. Guilty. Yeah. So this is what I'm saying. You can, you can go on any webinar today and learn something for free. I wish that would have existed 20 years ago. Cause I would have probably signed up for all of it because I, that was me. I was like, I don't know what to do. I don't know. I would have seen something online. I would have been like, I'll try that. I'll try that. And I think today we have, we live in a world where it's so beautiful. We have access to everything for free. And so, yeah, I, I think that's who is going to be attracted to me. Somebody who knows that there's something going on in the inside, but doesn't know what it is, or maybe it's addiction. Maybe it's not, maybe it's just the horrible relationship I'm in. You know, and that's why I created the 90 days because we don't know what it is until we take ourselves through a 90 day. Like it's kind of like taking your car in the shop and having them go through every freaking little everything from the knots on the wheels to the under the hood to see what's really pushing you. And when we take everything away and we start over, I'm guaranteed, I guarantee you at the end of 90 days, you'll have a real good idea of what's really gnawing at you. Right. So what and, I'm hearing is it's the person who feels disconnected. Like you can recognize that you're buffering. Yes. You're not allowing yourself to feel. You're not allowing yourself to be felt. Yeah. But, but what I'm hearing is you do specifically business coaching. So it's for someone who knows that that piece is getting in the way of their business success. So you're, you step in and support them. Well, what had happened, that's such a great thing that you recognize that because what had happened was I was business coaching. People would come to me and say, you had success, help me get success. Mm -hmm. But what I realized was the things that were preventing them from having success had nothing to do with business. And that's when I switched my coaching and thought it's about the 90 day program, because if I can get these successful business people to go through 90 days and work on themselves, take the time, they put all this time and energy into a business. And now it's kind of getting wonky is my favorite way to say it. Things get the foundation starts getting like this. Mm -hmm. And if they go personally through the 90 days, their business changes. It it's just so died. fascinating because I feel the yeah. same way about health. Yes. I mean, women come into my world and of course we're going to address the hormones and the thyroid well-being and the adrenals and weight and, and what you're eating and all of that. But really, it comes down to how do we be? How do we think? Yeah. Where do we lean away and where do we lean in? How do we exist in community as women? You know, for me, it's, it's all women and it's women together to go, I'm, I'm gonna actually allow myself to really be seen. And then all the stuff that we're trying to create, yes, I think the nutrition and the supplementation and the right testing and all of that makes a difference. But my guess is it's like 80% of just simply who we be with ourselves, who we be with others. It's so interesting that you talk, you talk about that because I can use myself as an example. So I work with one of the best doctors in 
Los Angeles, who's all about, you know, testing adrenals and, and putting, you know, compound pharmacy. And we, he and I were doing hormone stuff back in the nineties. And, and so I was doing all that, but guess what? I was drinking and I was not sleeping well and I was frustrated and, you know, I, I was doing all those great things, but then where was, I, when I finally got to that piece of, oh, if I just take this away, the alcohol, the, the frustration, the anger, you know, and then I'm using those beautiful things that he's putting me on how much better they work. Right. Yeah. So you get that. It's like, it's kind of like when you go to see an allergy, an allergist for a long time, they thought I had allergies. What I had was I used to do racing. And so I'd get that, uh, athletic asthma. And so they thought I had allergies. So I remember doing all this allergy testing and they start you like from scratch, right? They take everything away and then they add it back slowly to see what it is you're actually allergic to. And that's kind of what I do with my 90 day program It's like, we're going to take everything away and see what it is. That's really, like I said, gnawing at you and what you're obsessing about. Mm -hmm. Where okay. are your thoughts? And people, when people get so upset with me, because on the first day, when we, when we have our first, they get so upset. I'm like, I may not be the right coach for you because I make my clients do a lot of writing. Cause I'm like, we got to get it out of here. Mm -hmm. I need you to get it out of your head and onto paper. And that's a big part of my coaching because mm -hmm. I think sometimes we walk around with these obsessive thoughts that go on and on. The tape just keeps playing over and over again. I'm like, why don't you put it on paper and let the paper hold it for a while? Okay. <laughs> Let's get it out of here. You know, that there's something for me. I've just finally started writing my book and I, and I, um, there's something about pen to paper and the permanence of it wow. that for me felt in, intimidating. Okay, I also need to because I've I've watched this thought form come come to me a few times, and I so I just have to say it out loud. I go really ninety days. Like you've been doing this for ten years. The the naysayer in me goes, okay, someone can create some big shift in ninety days, but then what happens after ninety days? Now they just go back to the life that they lived. Um, help walk me through that. So any habit or any obsession or anything that's gnawing at us, the, the way, you know, you're going to get a little relief after 30 days, but to make it permanent, to make it like a new ritual, it, it takes 90 days. And anybody who says, oh no, I can fix that in 30 days. Well, yeah, you'll get some relief. You'll get a little pink cloud. You'll start to go, oh, I feel good. But I like to make things a little bit more permanent. And I think that when you really want to change a habit or start a habit. That's why that 75 hard program got so popular because he made it so that you had to, you had to go through 75 days of doing something consistently for 75 days. And everybody was like, Oh my God, this is the best thing ever. But what came out of it was these new formed habits. He, cause in his mind, he thought, well, if people do the 75 hard and they have one thing that they do from that program consistently after it's a win. And that's how I feel about my 90 days. If there's one thing you do after 90 days from the 90 day program that you now go, well, that really worked. That really worked because now it's ingrained and you keep it. That's a huge win. So it might not actually really be sobriety in 90 days. Let's call a spade a spade, but it oh, is no, a no, no, new no. habit. It's a new habit. And yeah. by the way, it, a lot of the people that I, I work with are not addicted. So it's kind of a cool thing because this woman that I'm working with, she doesn't have addiction problems, but she has, she's obsessing over something. And I said, well, let's try the 90 day programs with it and see mm -hmm. if we can lessen the obsession and build a new habit. Right. And that's the goal. I think with it is I'm doing all this right now. And if I remove it and I start doing all of this, Hopefully at the end of 90 days, one, two, three of those ideas worked for you and you continue them. Okay. And that's a value add right there. Yeah. So and I feel like a lot of this interview has been me just kind of trying to unpack what it is that you do. And I feel like I go, oh, you help people who want to create more success in their life. 
and allow themselves rather than fighting for their worthiness to actually allow themselves to be feel to be felt and deeply connected and in 90 days you help them develop new habits one two maybe that will then serve them for the rest of their lives yeah yeah and what you gotta there's no easy fix so there's a lot of coaches and i think you know this that are out there going this for free or this da 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 or get instant Anytime mm -hmm. anybody uses the word instant, I turn and run. No. There is no instant gratification. You have to do the work. That's and why this, my program's a year long. I'm like, yes, oh, I'm not going to. And even with a year long program, I'm not making any guarantees because you're the one that is going to have to take the steps and show up on the calls and shift what you put at the end of your fork and change how you think and dig in. And exactly. if you don't show up, what I know is that when women show up, it literally is the year that changes the trajectory of the rest of their life. And that, for that's, let me just tell you. So I tell people on the first call, I, first of all, if people work with me one-on-one, -on -one, I take a three month advance, you know, I, they pay three months in advance. Mm -hmm. That's how I work. Why do I do that? Cause I'm money hungry. No, I had success. I'm no, but what it tells them is I got to do this work. I yeah. just paid three months in advance. I got to do this work. See, when people pay, they pay attention. Yeah. And when they're yes, coming, I, so I see the biggest difference with my group coaching, the people that pop in twice a month and they, and by the way, they get, a, they get like pumped up and then they leave. But the people that work with me one-on-one, -on -one, they're actually doing like work because when they, when we meet again, I say, did you do that, that, that assignment or that, that writing thing or this, or did you? call those five people about this. And if they haven't done the work and I, I say, well, you're paying me, right? You're paying me. If you're not doing the work, I can't, it's like, we're, we're, we're starting from scratch on this call again. We have to start over. Yeah. So I'll give you a really good example of this. So I'm working with somebody who's struggling with a real, she's going through a divorce. I, you know, gave her a few things to do and not do until our next call. And she chose not to take the, the suggestions. And so on the next call, she was completely distraught. And all these things happened within a five day period. I said, well, we got to start over. Yeah. See, because every time we keep going back to the old habits, the old ideas, it sets us back again. Totally. And we got to start all over, right? You yeah. have, you have, I know you have this frustration with what you do. I mean, as you're sharing, I can think of two clients right now. One who is really feeling disconnected in her marriage. Yeah. And we did an hour long one on one call, really got into some specifics of steps to take and things to do together and conversations to have. And then the next time I see her, she's in the same place and she hasn't done anything. I feel like I go, no, like we're, we are not going to talk about another thing until you actually put into action what we what you agreed to because otherwise we're just spinning our wheels and I don't want to be or I don't want this program to be one more excuse for you to say I can't get out of my loop if you're not willing to actually put it into action or yeah. another woman who has really big aches and pains in her body a lot of inflammation and she's committed to trying out taking out gluten and her labs are showing that she's got a gluten sensitivity and her there's high inflammation in her body. So she says yes. And then she continues to not do it and can continue to come back with the same complaint. And I go, well, we're kind of where we started. Yeah. And by the way, that's a perfect example of something actually taking. It does take 90 days for that when we remove gluten to right. see a result. Yeah. And that's why that 90 days is kind of the magic number, because when we take out dairy out of our diet, we may not see the really good result for totally. 90 days to six months. Totally. I mean, a red blood cell doesn't generate, but every 120 days, your ovulation, right. for those of you that are still ovulating, like what we ovulate this month is from three months ago. Yeah. That we live in such a quick fix society. So on one hand, I'm going three months, is it really enough in the context of of addiction, no. In the context of habit formation, yes. But then even in that conversation, we still, but I, I assume you and I both, but up against 
the people that want it faster. Oh well, yeah, those right. are the people that go and get a pill. Right. <laughs> I want an idea, you know, ibuprofen, headaches away in a half an hour, an antibiotic, I whether it's perceived or real, I think I'm better in 48 hours, whatever it may be. I want to change the TV channel now. I want to unfriend someone or change it. It's like, go, go, go fast, fast, fast. Yes. But if we're going to go to foundational change, and once again, not fighting for our worthiness, but allowing ourselves to be felt and allowing ourselves to feel deeply connected and develop these new habits, man, it's a minimum of 90 days and people feel uncomfortable with that. And you know what? Sounds like both of us are saying, allow yourself to feel uncomfortable, but either change now or you're gonna pay much more significantly later because you're so you'll, you'll You'll love this. So, so I, on the other hand, I have a client who does everything I tell her to do and she goes, oh my God, this is amazing. Totally. Yes. Right, and she's like my biggest cheerleader and I'm like, God, I wish they were all, you know. But yeah. so then I get the text, I'm really suffering today. And I go, this is my response. That's great. Growth is happening because that's where my spiritual and emotional growth came from was when I was on my knees thinking I couldn't go another, I couldn't take another breath of air. It was, it hurt so bad to just breathe air. And I thought, I, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. And then you do, you mm -hmm. get through it, but you got to go through that, especially what it depends on what you're really dealing with. But if you're not willing to be uncomfortable and sit there and be uncomfortable and go, this will pass. I'm going to grow. I'm going to yeah. be so much better for this. It's, you know, we wouldn't have any Olympic athletes. We wouldn't have anybody at the height of their career. If they were, if they were just going to quit every time it got uncomfortable. Yeah. We wouldn't and, have marriages that last. We wouldn't have tides that come in and come out. And so, yeah, when I use that and I say, look, it's going to hurt. I, there's, I can't, yeah, I don't have a magic wand to take away the pain. If I did, I'd be a gazillionaire, mm -hmm. but I can take you through and guide you through something that will help. Yeah. Like I think so often we base things on TV and social media and how everything looks so perfect. Yeah. And um, man, in my marriage, we just came through a, a trough. Like there's those troughs and there's highs and we were like in it going, whoa, we haven't been in a trough like this in years. And it was uncomfortable as frick. Yeah. Luckily, we dug in and had the super difficult conversations. And it's so brilliant and beautiful on the other side. And, you know, I say to the people out there, you know, that doesn't mean I'm going to share that publicly on social media. I love what Brene Brown says around Brene, around um, vulnerability. The true vulnerability isn't posting it so everybody can see it. It's sharing your deepest, darkest shadows with the individuals that really know you and love you and see you the most. Yeah. And so I feel like that's the container that you and I are creating is that space for us to hold that container for someone to really show up and show their shadows in a truly vulnerable way yeah. and dig into the trough and come out the other side triumphant like we can't imagine and feeling ourselves and allowing those that we want to feel us feel us in a very different way absolutely mm -hmm. it's it's that's really what i call the work mm -hmm. it's private it's you're not going to see Byron Katie work like that kind of work or your own version of the work sorry my, I, wait, my own version i love byron katie i actually know byron I, I, she's great. I know her. I worked with her. Um, that's why I said, I've had so many beautiful people along the way on this journey that have guided me and mentored me that, you know, I have so much gratitude for all their work that mm. they do, you know, but yeah, no, what I'm saying is it's, it is, it's private. I, I don't think you'll ever see really anything. Like I said, I don't record anything. I'm not using it for, because I want people to be able to go, I need help. Mm -hmm. And, and in a really private, safe way, because that's what I needed. I needed that. I needed a private, safe place to share things that I was afraid to share. And you can't the social media is not the place for that. Yeah. It's just not.
-hmm. I get so, I get really upset when people post things that are really private on social media. Like I don't need to know every detail. That energy is very um, odd for me to see when people post either about their divorce in a really derogatory way or some hospital visit or a death of them standing on a grave. It's those, that's energy. That's very odd to me. Mm. Yeah. It's a fine line. Uh, it's a fine line. And it's, it's, it's on a platform that's, I don't know what the motive is behind it. And that's the fascinating thing. I've, it? I've seen videos of people at a funeral Mm -hmm. taking video at the funeral of the person speaking, giving the eulogy <laughs> at the funeral. Yeah. And I'm thinking, what? Yeah. You know, it's the weirdest. It's, I call it odd energy. It's odd energy. It's. And it's feeding into, I think we all, many of us have this like voyeuristic curiosity. We want to look in the woman's purse. We want to see it in her closet. We want to read her diary. Yeah. And so it's feeding into that curiosity. Well, that's I why I do a where, weekly blog. It's like right out of my journal. So there you have yeah. it. It's, it's <laughs> So speaking of that, I'm aware of time. I want to just allow a space for you to finish up. But for those of you listening in the show notes, Deborah's all of her social media um, handles and also Spotify and her website. I love the quote, Deborah, let go of the old stories that do not serve your purpose by Deborah Driggs. So beautiful. Um, but she also has a gift for everyone. Speaking of the. Um, yeah. So this is funny. This letter. is completely separate from what I do. But my grandfather left a manuscript behind. He died in 1998 and my grandmother died in 2017. And in 2017, when I was with her and I was cleaning out stuff. I, I found this box in her garage and it was, it looked important. It was a lot of like a manuscript, a book. Mm -hmm. And I shipped it to LA. She was in Florida and I didn't really open it again until 2019. And I started reading this book and I thought, this is my grandfather. Like there were so many things in this I just read it. And as I was reading it, it was like a puzzle. I was kind of putting it together and I decided it was going to be a book. That was it. I didn't know how, I didn't know how, you know, I'd never, I've never published a book before. I even thought about it. Not only did I decide it was going to be a book, but I thought it's going to be a movie. And so anyway, I, the book came out in October. It's called son of a Basque and it's based on my grandfather's life. Anybody who's listening right now, or you see the show notes, if you subscribe to my personal letter, I will see it and I will respond personally, get your address and send you a signed copy of the book. Oh, how kind of you. Thank you. Yeah. So Deborah Driggs, <laughs> any <laughs> parting words, anything else for you that feels unsaid that that needs to be shared? I just want to thank you. Honestly, just from the bottom of my heart for this honest conversation for the beautiful questions that you asked me. There's a lot of gratitude for what you do, what you contribute to the world with women. Yeah. Much needed today. And just thank you with yeah. so much gratitude. I'm blessed. I'm really, truly blessed because I get to meet people like you. And that's a gift. I know. I think, I think we're going to meet in person at some point. For I, I, sure. I don't know when or where, but I feel like, I feel like it's going to happen. And now the landscaper, the leaf blower is outside, you know, behind the scenes, I have no idea. I was also recording this in GarageBand and I'm getting these alerts that it's not picking up my microphone. We've got it on Zoom. We've got it in Facebook. It's going to be so fascinating for the sound editor to splice this all together for the podcast. And I'm sure it's going to be beautiful. So for those listening in the podcast, if the sound sounds different, oh, I was doing the technology juggle behind the scenes and um, and the podcast editor has done a phenomenal job at pulling this all together. While Deborah and I simply got to sit here and have a really thought provoking and heart opening conversation that feels very real. And it was there was no preparation or script here. I did. I didn't know where the conversation would go. And it's been really beautiful. So thanks for Thank who you. you are in the world and to take all the fame and all the glamour and all the the Oprah and the MTV and the Howard Stern and the magazine covers and now saying all that power, all that money didn't leave me with fulfillment. 
And now I want to feel fulfilled, I want to feel connected, and I want to feel like I'm doing good in the world with a ripple effect that helps others do good in the world in their own version of it. So that's spectacular. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. And with that, for those listening in the Women's Vibrancy Code podcast, thank you for listening. Follow us. You've got us on social media. You've got our contact information. And Deborah has given away a couple really sweet free things. And you're welcome to reach out to her if you have any questions around her work. All right. Thank you. Of course. Ciao, ciao.